Hello and welcome to EMS Research with Professor Bram, where we talk about the research-related issues that matter to those who work in emergency medical services. Today, we'll be talking about pre-hospital RSI. Welcome to EMS Research Vlog and Podcast from the studio here in Houston, Texas. I'm your host, Bram Duffy, a full-time paramedic who works in an ambulance, just like many of you. I'm also an assistant professor of communication at Kennesaw State University, and I have an appointment at the Institute for Social Innovation at Fielding Graduate University. So before we get started, I want to share a couple things. First, I actually have a research study that's in progress, and I'm opening it to first responders. So if you want to be part of it, come check it out at the website, professorbram.com, professorbram.com, and you can click on the research tab to apply and look more. I also want to share that I've written two books on communication, and the most recent book has been just released called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can find the link to the book below, but also for sure, hang out till the end and I'll be able to tell you more about it. Recently, I've been able to spend some time on the website of the International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute. And I just want to highlight their work right now because of their really cost affordable books for training. And the coolest thing that I found on their website was that they right now have literature reviews that are out for each year. This is only volume five, but I got volumes one through five and they are able to connect what research is out there to the field perspective because they give little tidbits for each research article that comes out. And so these are available at a super cheap price. I know they're not making any money. I think it was like $5. So I just wanted to mention that. And I think uh, they come through Amazon, but also through their website is iphmi.com. So that's the International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute. They're doing some really cool stuff. I just wanted to highlight it. Next up, we have... Penny Chasson, who's really a gem to join us today because she's a woman of intelligence and experience and talent. And Penny has this rich career in nursing that began back in 1994. And her most significant contributions in healthcare came about through her working as a, a registered nurse and then a nurse anesthetist. And all of this stuff has set her up for us to be able to talk more about research articles together that have to do with airway. And the other thing that is really cool on the side is that she's a board certified hypnotherapist. And so as a hypnotist, she is really able to give different perspectives on this as well as having that connection with me because my book has that um, connection with hypnosis. So it's all pretty neat stuff. You know, She's the founder of Genesis Hypnosis Services and Training based in Philadelphia. I just want to say hey and ask, did I, uh, did I miss anything? No, you didn't miss anything. And first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me onto the show. I really appreciate that. And to just provide a little bit of background and context to my ability to speak to the subject that we're on today, eight of my 10 years as a registered nurse were in a cardiothoracic critical care unit. And out of my 15 years in anesthesia, I worked in a community-based facility. I also worked in a level one trauma center where we trained residents. And we also trained nurse anesthesia students. And during my tenure in Connecticut at a small community hospital, I worked with the New Britain Emergency Medical Services Paramedic Program to validate their medics in RSI and to basically check off that they had the necessary skills to even go into the OR to even be with the patient. And that's why you're here. It's so awesome yes. for you to be awesome, you know, awesomely connected. So we're going to talk about this article called Prehospital Rapid Sequence Intubation by Paramedics, a Scoping Review. It comes out from the Journal of Emergency Medicine, Trauma, and Critical Care. I have um, a, a, a printout here, and I know that you got a, 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 a look at it as well. And the summary looks something like this. This is a big boy article that 
reviews the use of RSI. This is a technique that's used in anesthesia for to be able to get an endotracheal tube in the right spot quickly. And it's used by paramedics in emergency situations and also emergency room doctors pretty commonly. And the focus um, of, of RSI um, is really based on the, the uh, anesthesia part is this fourth step that really causes uh, full loss of consciousness and the muscle paralysis. And so there's some controversy over the safety and feasibility of using anesthesia agents and especially in pre-hospital situations by paramedics. And so the review aimed to describe some of the common indications for RSI and what the complications were that were out there and some of the anesthesia agents that were used in the success rates. And so this whole research study that, that they were doing went from January of 2010 up through March of 2021. So kind of a big, long deal. And indications for performing an RSI include decreased consciousness, airway obstruction, respiratory failure, burns, shock, transportation considerations, or aspiration. Other indications that uh, were grouped based on the cause of injury or the illness were set up with things like respiratory distress, cardiovascular emergencies, and neurological problems. So many of you are familiar with, uh, with RSI, um, but I I'm just going to count on maybe half the audience you know, having that familiarity. So let me just share um, as part of the summary. So we know that rapid sequence intubation is a high-risk medical procedure that can lead to really severe complications like oxygen desaturation and also lead lethal cardiac arrhythmias. So these complications can increase mortality rates or they can worsen the outcomes in terminally ill people. The most common complication is oxygen desaturation, which is particularly critical in about 50% of the cases. We know that there was a recent situation in the news about a, a paramedic who's got his license pulled because um, he didn't reposition and protect the airway during a time that he was giving, I believe, ketamine at the time. But, you know, these are, these are things that, um, that we have to think about. So the article talked about how RSI doesn't seem to be associated with really severe complications in patients with non-traumatic uh, brain pathologies like tumors or injuries with diabetic stuff. But more research uh, needs to be pushed is what they talked about. And, you know, paramedics face a lot of challenges performing RSI, especially in pre-hospital, because uh, we have complications that we just typically uh, face. And some of these complications, an emergency room doctor themselves would take the resources out to call anesthesia in for help, you know? And so those include things like having a shorter neck or a larger tongue or lingerie edema or obesity. So these, these are commonly, um, you know, these are common situations that even the ER doctor would ask for help, help with. Um, the article talked about how ketamine is commonly used and um, due to the rapid onset of action and the ability to improve um, the view, but it's also controversial because it can affect the neurological and you know, hemodynamic stability. So um, the other drug that, that uh, is involved here is succocholine, and it's the paralytic agent that's the big boy drug. I like to use that word to mean like the, the, the one that matters, and that's the one that's going to be able to um, take away um, all ability to move, but you know, we have to also uh, know that bradycardia and uh, hyperkalemia, these are things that we have to, um, to worry about. Um, some places uh, commonly use RSI, and there are studies that have been shown that there are increased complications in some, in some situations, but um, the overall view of RSI that's out there is that it's safe. That's why we continue to, to do it. And I want to bring an expert here, like I, like I did with Penny, to be able to sort of break some of this down because I know that I've been in situations where um, just 
to be not not that I want to be graphic, but I've been in situations where I was fighting really hard to keep a patient alive. And the main problem is an airway. And so we get into um, situations where we have clenched teeth and vomiting and um, you know, and you add that to a patient that's confused and um, combative and, you know, it's a real you know, nightmare situation. And back before we had RSI, I um, were, I have been, was in situations where we use those mouth screws, which um, are used to stick in between the teeth and twist so that you can get their mouth open in situations like that, where you're, worried about clenched teeth with airway problems. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I've been from in, in from situations like that into situations where I had to um, sm- start with a pediatric uh, oral airway and then um, sort of like stick that in and crank open the mouth and then you just keep moving up sizes, you know, until you can get their mouth open more and more. I mean, just really dramatic things have to happen when you don't have – of the ability to sedate your patient. But I guess what we're talking about is that the balance of, you know, not being able to versus um, uh, versus the ability to. And so, Penny, as a nurse with your specific experience, tell me about your thoughts on, you know, I am biased. So that's why I wanted to kick this over to you. Tell me about your, you know, thoughts about the proficiency and um, the ability for paramedics to pull this off. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. And where I'm going to start with is that the environments in which paramedics are working, and I'm not talking about this scene, I'm talking about whether you're in rural America, you're in an inner city, you're in a hospital that's in the suburbs, your exposure to patients in situations in order to maintain those skills once they're acquired is hugely varied. And in my experience, uh, when I was in New England, because at several of the hospitals where I trained and gave anesthesia, we would have paramedics come through on rotation. And the minimum required number of successful intubations in order to be signed off was 10 successful intubations. Now, as a anesthesia provider and an in-hospital provider, I want to be very clear that that's the perspective my next statement comes from. I find that woefully inadequate. However, it's more about having the skills and the technique because the job that a paramedic doing is doing is securing an airway in an emergency situation where you're looking at life or death. You're not in the OR giving an elective anesthetic. You're not in the emergency room stabilizing somebody up to the critical care unit or to the OR for trauma surgery. You're you're literally making a call. And I believe that as long as the awareness of the minimum safety standards and knowing the anatomy and having the muscle memory and the skills to manipulate the airway, I believe that's a good start, provided there is continuing exposure to controlled situations to maintain those skills. Because a medic may be in an area where, you know, you don't see that many calls where you actually need to perform um, intubation. And so I think that the variety of situations and working environments that medics find themselves in has to be a paramount consideration in this discussion. Let's talk about training then. And, you know, I hate to be this way, but I compare everybody else's training to my own experience. I just feel like I have to, I think to myself, okay, I'm able to, to handle these particular level situations. And I know that this is my background, my training. So I just compare myself to everybody else. And so one of the things I want to ask you about is I want to understand a little bit more about like, what your training is because we have to really be able to compare that to what a paramedics training is because so when I went through paramedic school, of course it was 25 years ago, I did clinical rotations so that I went to the OR and I did work with anesthesia to do intubations. But 
and this may be hard for some people to hear, but the truth is that I had a huge amount of intubation practice on cadavers, huge amount. And the yeah. reason is because, you know, we work in a clinical learning environment all of the time. And, you know, we work a code that the, the person died, the, you know, the person is getting ready to get shipped off to the morgue. And before they go to the morgue, oh, by the way, where are the students? And this is how we learned. And so the emergency room doctors or the, you know, whoever the provider that was there in the environment happily would teach, show anatomy, let you uh, practice. And so as a result of that, you know, I feel like that I got a really advanced level, um, you know, um, experience. And then the cool kind of experience, my bra I just have to share this, the cool kind of experience, the bragging rights I always have is that I got to participate in a program called um, PAX, P-A-C-T-S, in St. Louis, and they... Um, and they give anest they, the veterinarians give anesthesia to the cats, and you get to be able to allow you to practice for infant intubations on humans. So I've got to go to do that program too. So anyway, I've got to do some cool stuff. But I guess the point of all this was that, you know, um, the the number of cadavers that I got to do, or un, I can't even count. And so times have changed, you know, and that's not a practice that's normal or really allowed anymore. And I don't understand what all's happened in the, in the, you know, in the last 25 years, but, you know, uh, practicing um, on fresh cadavers, I guess would be the word to use is, yeah. it's just, it's, I don't know what happened, but it's just not done. And so, you know, um, I, no matter the reason that it's not done anymore, it, the experience is not being given quite to the level that I got to have. And the, the thing about it is that um, there's a lot of people, and I've, I've even talked and worked with physician medical directors who kind of have the attitude that it's not that big of a deal because they're intubating people who aren't alive, right? So it's, you know, and that's kind of the mindset of what's what paramedics are doing. You know, oh, yeah, they can do whatever out there because, you know, they're really um, doing last-ditch things is kind of the, the, the mindset. But what we're talking about today is not that, not that at all. You know, we're talking about someone yeah. who's very much alive that we're trying to keep alive. So I, I should just, I just dumped a whole bunch of stuff on you, but the point is yeah. I want to know more about, you know, what you went through to, to get there because it's a lot different than yeah. well, a lot of paramedics today are able to, I'm sure. Right. So especially when paramedics go into the OR in places like that to train, to intubate, you have to think about, you know, Again, like you mentioned, the process that I went through when I trained. Now, we intubated mannequins, but you probably know the mannequins I talk about. They're the ones that are stiff, and if you barely touch mm -hmm. the teeth, the teeth click. You can't manipulate an airway, and the anatomy just doesn't look like human anatomy. I never intubated that mannequin successfully before I went into the OR. But when I went into the OR, of course, the focus initially was, can you mask, can you adequately mask ventilate? Like that's a skill mm -hmm. you have to have mm -hmm. before you even think about rapid sequence induction, unless you're dealing with a patient who's vomiting and all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to manage that airway. And that is the first skill that has to be mastered. And that's what I taught my uh, students in the program when I had the privilege of teaching. And when they came into the OR, that was the first thing. When it came to doing direct laryngoscopy and manipulating the airway, as a student, I would be given five to 10 seconds mm -hmm. to locate the glottic opening and to attempt to pass the tube. And you're holding your breath. And, th and, and then it was like, okay, like let, because the longer you're manipulating that airway and the airway's not secured, the risk of the patient aspirating goes up, even if they don't have gastroparesis or a full stomach. So they would give you time. They wouldn't rush you, but then they would, you know, it's like, okay, sometimes, you know, after, I don't know, your fourth or fifth patient, they might would give you a second look attempt if you saw it. And it's like, oh, I was right there. The tube just glanced off the glottic opening. They'll let you mask for a few breaths. And then you go back for a second attempt. And if you didn't get it, the experienced anesthetist or the physician mm -hmm. would, would take over. So it can take 
multiple attempts for a medic to get a patient in a situation where they get those successful intubations. I, I was probably, now you have to consider being an anesthesia student, I was being put in different rooms for different experiences, whereas a paramedic, mm -hmm. you go into the OR as a student, they're finding you the intubation cases. Mm -hmm. So for me, they weren't finding me the intubation cases. I was assigned to whatever room. And if I had the opportunity to intubate, then I had the opportunity to attempt intubation. So it was probably around three weeks before I secured my first airway with an endotracheal tube. And it was because of that sporadic um, experience. But it was a longer, more focus. thorough experience, right? Because you were getting well, yeah. the whole thing and the paramedics just pop in for that time and pop out. Yeah, it was, we had 15 months of clinical, mm -hmm. it, but it was again, a variety of situations, but you had to have those intubation skills solid. They gave us like three months before they started letting us rotate through being in a room, giving an anesthetic alone, because if something happened during the course of a sedation or using a laryngeal mask airway, and we started to have airway problems, they needed us to be able to recognize that to be able to mask and call for our backup immediately. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to attempt intubation at all mm -hmm. uh, without a physician there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really the difference in the training. I, I do remember periodically seeing residents or uh, probably not a paramedic student because I never saw them in the ICU, but being allowed to attempt intubation on someone who had, who had just expired. Um, I, I do remember seeing that now the SIM labs they have now are much better. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't necessarily know that they have those for paramedic programs. And I have to tell you, the experience that you had was an outstanding. I know. Um, and it was, part, it was, the, maybe it was because I was in a rural part of the country, you know, or, um, you know, well, I'm just not sure, but to me, everything was normal, you know, because we were training. So. Yeah, I, I think that probably one of the greatest resources available out there, there's a book called The Walls Manual of mm -hmm. Emergency Airway Management, and it goes through so many of these critical things that I think we're about to touch on uh, talking about RSI, and they have something called the Difficult Airway Course. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they allow medics in, but if you ever got the opportunity to go, that's like the gold standard of difficult airway management. There are uh, some physicians that are steering EMS just towards ketamine only, and so that the succinylcholine atomidate would, um, you know, not be uh, available to them. And so that's sort of like the kinds of drugs that we have to uh, that we have to play with. You know, Versed sucks. I think that that book I just mentioned, there's a study in there and it's been a long time since I read the book. So forgive me for not remembering the authors, but they did a study where they looked at rapid sequence intubation with and without muscle relaxant. Mm -hmm. And the co control group was obviously without muscle relaxant. And this was in a setting in ICUs in a hospital. Mm -hmm. The outcomes were so poor for patients without muscle relaxant, they had to abort the study. They could not ethically continue with the study. So for me, unless something has drastically changed, that actually sounds like a step backward. Mm -hmm. um, some, I know that not everyone is, you know, validated to use paralytics and sometimes you, you have to do what you have to do. But it almost feels like a step backward to me because with succinylcholine, um, you know, you have to be aware of your renal patients. If somebody has been down for a while and they might be in rhabdo and their potassium is up or, you know, situations where you might be concerned about malignant hyperthermia, certainly you're not going to want to use succinylcholine. But what we would do in anesthesia is we would give a very tiny defasciculating dose of rocuronium, mm -hmm. five milligrams, and give it about a minute to circulate, which RSI, the very definition is you don't wait a minute, mm -hmm. right? So it kind of takes 
rocuronium out of the equation there unless you choose to give that little bit before you give your sedative agent. But if you lose track of time, even that five milligrams of rocuronium can cause somebody to get weak and floppy enough that they struggle. But that little bit of rocuronium can prevent the muscle fasciculations that can potentially cause an increase in intracranial pressure and intraocular pressure if you have a blowout injury and the increase in potassium. But in the anesthesia where we tend to go, even for rapid sequence induction, we started to make the move over to using rocuronium. Mm -hmm. And that's because, um, and forgive me, I have not been in the hospital setting since 2019. It's, it's definitely still used in the field. I just missed it from our list. Right. Yeah. But there is a reversal agent now for rocuronium. It's expensive. Um, last I knew it was not generic yet. But if you were to give rocuronium and you could not secure that airway, there is now a reversal agent for rocuronium. Um, that's a lot for one person to manage in the field. Uh, the paramedic service that I trained for I got to go out on the on the bus with them mm -hmm. and if there was an airway situation they called up a backup paramedic mm -hmm. so you had two medics on scene mm -hmm. plus your EMT so it you weren't by yourself yeah, you had I, someone to help you to make the judgment call do we RSI do we not RSI and, and to make sure you had your airway set up so it, it's just something to consider in terms of um, ketamine only. I, I don't, as an anesthesia provider, I don't know how I would feel about that. I do know that um, a few years ago, I ran into an old friend who happened to be a paramedic here in rural Mississippi, and we were chit chatting. And I told him how, you know, I did this training with the medics. And he said, Yeah, they don't let us RSI here. So if I have somebody and I'm worried about losing their airway, I just document they had a seizure, and that gives me the ability to push 10 milligrams of Valium, and then I intubate. And I, I was mortified, mm -hmm. right? That yep. somebody gets into a situation where they can't manage an airway mm -hmm. or they have such significant concern for an airway and being able to take safe care of that patient that they would say they witnessed a seizure that they did not witness yeah it's totally to be able to use a medication like valium to to intubate and did i go out and report this person no it it, it doesn't pertain to me and it was shared with me like it's not an uncommon practice so what i would think should happen it would be that if you're in a situation as a paramedic where you have those types of protocols, then what you should do is call the physician medical director on the phone at 2 a.m. and say, this is my patient. This is what's going on. And then absolutely, they'll be able to give you orders to give that 10 milligrams of Valium. And, and I've actually been in a really similar scenario to, to that. And that's yeah. what happened. And that's, um, I'm pretty sure across the board of the whole country, that's pretty much the standard, you know, of what you would have to do. But there are yeah. some providers that, um, that only require that one paramedic be there. And I think it's maybe it's the, uh, depending upon the service, you know, some ambulance services, there's only one ambulance. So, but I've always uh, been an advocate for and appreciated those systems where I worked in and that gave uh, two paramedics as a requirement. And, you know, part of it is that, um, the, the first thing that you mentioned, which is most important, maintaining an adequate seal on that mask and, and ventilating for that patient and keeping that going, you know, like um, someone needs to be keeping an eye on that happening all the time. So, you know, while you're doing that, you're also doing drug calculations to figure out, you know, your kilograms conversion and then your drug conversions. And then you have like three syringes to draw up. You have, you know, all these, all these tasks that um, are really asking a lot of one person. Um, and yeah. so that's, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that too. I think as healthcare providers, we get jaded on that because we have so much staff around us. And sometimes we think, how can one person do that? But I can tell you, I've worked call. I have been sent emergently to OB. 
um, I had to talk about difficult airways and needing to rapid sequence OB. I got called up one day and I'm sitting at the desk. I'm prepping to do an epidural on somebody and a nurse runs out of another room and says, get everybody in the C-section suite now. And I'm, I knew something was wrong mm -hmm. and I went running in and the patient was abrupting. So it was a whole hemorrhagic situation mm -hmm. and you know, I called my backup and there were emergencies in the OR. There was no one to come back me up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm calling for emergency blood and all the things. And, you know, it's just that rapid check. Can I pressurize my oxygen? Does my blade have a light that works? Is my tube ready to go? Do I have my drugs? And just boom, boom, boom. So can one person do it? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, but, but I think, you know, special like emergency physicians, you're accustomed to having nurses drawing up your meds and respiratory fixing your tube. It, it's totally doable. It's just in the field. You you have a lot of other considerations. You even have scene safety to bring into the mix mm -hmm. of preparing to do this RSI. Tell me for you, if you were stuck in the field, what would be some of the reasons that you'd say, okay, this, this is definitely an, an intubation case versus a BiPAP case? Or... Yeah, so... So if I had monitors, right, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I had monitors, if they were unable to maintain adequate saturation with the maximum oxygen I was providing, even if they were breathing on their own, you know, if, if their sats are consistently, I don't know what your guidelines are, but me as an anesthesia provider, if their sats were persistently in the 80s and I could not get them up to 90 or greater, um, then that would probably be a call um, if I had exhausted suctioning, positioning, mm -hmm. like all, all those things, which you may not have the luxury for in the field. The other thing is if they can't maintain their airway, like if they're getting hypercapnic and mm -hmm. they're getting somnolent, they, they're losing their reflexes, they can't maintain that airway, or they are clearly physically exhausted. That's what I was getting ready to say. Like they look tired, right? That's the way yeah. you're pushing towards. Okay. Yeah. If they're clearly physically exhausted, then if you, it's a judgment call, right? And I think this is where people get into a, a expertise contest. I'm going to mm -hmm. say it nicely. I won't say a bad word. They get into this contest over who has the better education to make that judgment call. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you could stretch them out another 15, 20 minutes, which might get you to the ER. Other times they might stop breathing in the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. And then there you are, single handed, you know, bumping down the road. You know how it is. Mm -hmm. Trying to get that airway back. Right. So it's situational, so, right? If you have the resources right now, maybe we better wait because even sometimes dumping an emergency patient on an ER can be a, a mess too, because if they're yeah. not ready or don't have. Yeah. So if, if they're exhausted, um, in, in knowing that if they're exhausted after you intubate them and that uh, sympathetic effect from metomidate when that wears off, their blood pressure is probably going to crash, mm -hmm. right? Knowing that that's going to be a natural sequela of taking away that work of breathing when they've been really, really pushing hard. I know that I mentioned it at the start, but you are also blessed with more than one expertise. And so given your unique background that you've studied both anesthesia and hypnosis, I just wanted to ask about your, maybe you have insights for us. Do any of these disciplines collide in any kind of way? They do. They do. Because when we're in healthcare, we're in a position, we're seen as being in a position of authority. And basically expertise is what I mean when I say authority. That automatically makes people more uh, suggestible, right? They're more open to receiving. But when you're on scene, it's an emotional situation. And in these emotional situations, we're automatically bypassing the critical thinking part of the mind. If you've ever been somewhere and, and something catastrophic has happened and people are walking around dazed and in shock, you can just tell them what to do. They're just looking for somebody to direct them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the same thing goes for our patients. They're more suggestible in the things that we say. Um, if we you know, just are careful about how we choose our words, right? They'll actually be beneficial to the patient. Sometimes just simply saying, you know what? 
I understand you're afraid right now. Validate that. I know you're afraid right now, but we have everything that we need here to stabilize you and, and get you to the hospital. Or if you're dealing with an IV, this is my favorite trick in the book. If you're trying to get an IV in and somebody's freaking about the IV, you just tell them, I want you to think about that arm over there. Think about that arm over there and feel, I don't know if they're laying on the floor, feel the carpet under your hand, right? And I'm going to put some cold alcohol here. And you know how cold is when you stick your hand in a nice cold bucket of water, your hand is really numb. This alcohol is really cold. It's numb and focus on your hand over there and you're confusing them. And while you're confusing them, they can't focus on you putting the IV in. That's, that's one of my favorite tricks. But the one thing I would like to say about hypnosis is that I know a lot of people discount it. They say it's stage stuff. It's woo-woo. In the 1800s, James Easdale was doing surgeries using hypnotic techniques. And PTSD, IBS, and pain are the three most studied areas in medicine for hypnosis because it's it's effective and it's easy to track the outcomes thinking about hypnotic techniques for stress release and just reframing things in your life if you feel that you have symptoms of PTSD from having gone through that then i would encourage you to just reach out to someone who has experience and the ability to guide you through that process and you're um, one of those folks who's in practice so i'm going to include your information on the um, on the links in the in the screen so that folks can reach out to you directly for your practice as well yeah well it was good to have you on the show thank you so much for being here Thank you for having me. I, you know what? You can take me out of the OR. You'll never take the OR out of me. <laughs> Nursing uh, will always be there. Anesthesia will always be there. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's why you're here today. Thank you so much again. <laughs> I want to also invite you to check out my latest book I co-authored with Four Arrows, who has two doctorates and is an expert on indigenous scholarship and hypnosis. So I just want to invite you to check it out because we introduce a method for communicating with patients on the scene of an emergency that takes advantage of some of the properties found in hypnosis. This book works to change the way we approach and interact with any kind of emergency patient in acute distress because it's going to help you be a better practitioner and use communication as a healing tool. Right now, there's just not a lot of training in how to talk to your patient. And if you've been stuck with a patient for any period of time and, and you need to have a conversation, it's awesome to be able to have a healing conversation. This book is called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can follow the link below to find it, or you can find it literally almost anywhere you type in the name or my name. I had a friend that mailed me a book and wanted an autograph. Don't mail me a bunch of books. Just let me know that you want an autograph for the book, and I'll be happy to send you over a sticker. I have some stickers made that are pretty awesome that I'll send you that you can put in the cover. Hi, I'm Will Chaplow from the International Pre-Hospital Medicine Institute. You might know about us because of the literature reviews that we post every month free to, for your review on our website at iphmi.com and also published through GEMS Online Magazine every month. We've been doing them for five years, so now we've accumulated over 240 literature reviews over the past five years. And we've gotten feedback from our audience that said they'd like to have these things as desk references, so they'd had a rapid reference. Well, we've done it. And there are now five volumes of these books, one for each year that we've been publishing them. Uh, this is the latest version, uh, volume five. And as I said, in each of these, there's at least 48 literature reviews. They're all cataloged in the beginning of the book, so you can see um, what the topic area is, what pages those reviews are on, and how you can find them quickly. And again, these are a great reference, whether you're putting a lecture together, uh, working on a paper, uh, studying, whatever it is. This gives you the depth of field of the science that dictates what we do in the field or what we should be doing in the field or why we've changed the way we do things in the field. In any event, as with all of our publications, we've priced these because we want you to be able to have this book. It's only $4.99 in the written and the copy, the hard copy here. And they're all five of them are available at that price. But you can also get them as ebooks. And they're available as ebooks from Amazon, from uh, Apple, from Barnes and Noble, wherever you get you get your ebooks for the price of $2.99. So again, we don't do this um, with an aim towards getting wealthy. We do these because we want you guys to be able to have these materials. Relevant information, affordable information, and an access so you can get to it. So you want the hard copies? Go on Amazon, $4.99. Go to your ebook store and you get it for 
if you're in the business, this is the kind of material you want to have around to settle those firehouse arguments or to help you put your materials together. Thanks again. See you all soon. Thanks. The other thing before we close that I want to share is that I'm doing a research project related to first responders who live in the United States. And I could really use your help if you don't mind being interviewed over a video call. So go to my website, fill out the form that's at professorbram.com, professorbram.com. And thank you again for listening. I look forward to sharing more insights with you in this next episode. If you enjoy EMS research, please tell your friends, like, share, and subscribe to help others get the message. And then stay tuned for the credits at the end so you can see the research articles that we talked about in today's episode.